we've heard from Kathy Schwab before about the community affordable housing strategy. And while I understand this is not the final product, um, Kathy is here to talk about what um, they heard uh, in the county specifically related to housing and the housing needs in the county. So please come forward. Welcome again. Thanks for having me today. Um, you know, just for those of you who might be new and uh, who don't know us, uh, LISC is a national community development um, institution. We're formed by Treasury and started by the Ford Foundation, actually 30, 40 years ago, uh, to really focus on affordable housing. But over those 40 years, we've like morphed into doing funding for daycare centers and federally qualified health clinics and uh, business districts and other things. So. Um, Coming back to our roots, uh, I want to just explain a little bit sort of the framework for this and why we got started on this. Um, it actually happened in uh, 2016 when then um, Vice Mayor David Mann uh, announced that he wanted to invest $4 million out of the sale of the Blue Ash Airport um, into affordable housing. And I'd been at LISC for 11 years. I had not heard a public official say that we have a problem with affordable housing. That was the first time. So I called him, I said, this is great, but $4 million is a drop in the bucket. How can we leverage that? And that was, the, we, he let us put together a task force, um, and that led to cr the creation of a housing trust fund, which the city enacted a year or so ago at, at his leadership. Um, it's unfunded, but it, it, it exists um, as, as a vehicle. The other thing they allowed us to do is, is put the money into uh, affordable home ownership. And during that time, he says, well, we need, we need housing stock for 80% of area median income, which is you know, roughly 40,000 and up. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, because the developers tell me that. And I said, well, that's not good enough. We, we, have to, we have to study this. So we asked for a grant from our national office, um, and we commissioned the Community Building Institute, also did your fair housing report, um, to do a Hamilton County affordability study. And that study actually um, it came out with the, the 40,000 unit number that you might have heard and read in the paper. Uh, it, it basically shared that, and, and we have a copy on our website, and I'm giving, giving you the link in the, in the handout. But that, um, that study showed that there are hundreds of thousands of Hamilton County residents that are cost burdened. So housing affordability means that you're not spending more than 30% of your income on housing. So it, it's a huge problem. It's a problem all over the country, and we just tried to quantify it here in the county. And you really can't look at housing in the city alone, so we all the data was based on Hamilton County data. Um, we then uh, took that on the road as a, like a road show, telling everybody trying to raise awareness. Uh, we looked at the vacant property in Hamilton County because the report also said there was about 50,000 vacant units in Hamilton County. We ended up mapping about 17,000 parcels. So we do have that data. It's housed at the Port Authority uh, and the land bank is using it. We worked on a business plan with the Port Authority so that they could take both the vacant tax delinquent properties, all of the properties, into the land bank so that we can then match them up with the affordability gap. We worked on that in 2018, but there was a gap and that housing gap, that financial gap, was what I, I started um, in 2018 looking for. I went to Greater Cincinnati Foundation, I went to Bethesda Inc., our largest health foundation, because the health systems now are really trying to focus on the social determinants and housing is like a fundamental social determinant of health. So they agreed to fund a housing strategy because they wanted to know Affordable housing is a huge issue. Housing is a huge issue. Do you focus on 80% AMI, workforce housing? Do you focus on homelessness? Do you focus on, what? where do you do that? So we agreed, and I'm not a process person, but we agreed to sort of lead, because we could not find anyone at the city to help us do this, to help us lead this, because these are usually led by planning commissions, uh, by mayors uh, of cities, so we, could not get that to happen. We did get a resolution from the city and we got a nod from the county to, to go through with this work. We got it funded by Greater Cincinnati Foundation and there's a couple other funders that you'll see on my last slide. Um, 
We then hired researchers from the University of Pennsylvania who also did the Philadelphia housing plan, which we liked a lot. We looked at them all across the country. So there's 90 slides of data on our website all about Hamilton County that I, I invite you to take a look at. I just picked like the top three or four slides which really help inform. Uh, actually, one of these slides came from Tom Carroll's research in the first suburbs. Uh, we've worked closely with him on his research and making sure that that data was also included in this. But as you all know, poverty has increased in the county over the last 10 years. Um, a housing wage in Hamilton, well, it says Cincinnati MSA, so I'm assuming, I'm not exactly sure where what that includes, but a housing wage is $17 an hour. And you know uh, that is not the minimum wage here. Um, we also sort of measured the cost burden uh, across both um, in all income levels and across race. And of course, uh, we found that cost burden by race is higher both in rental and in home ownership. Um, and just another interesting point, um, the, the researchers did some data on the, the aging housing stock in the county. I mean, as you know, it's like mostly built post-World War II, and it's, you know, it's aging as definitely our city housing stock is. And so the, a preservation of those units, which most of the affordable housing throughout the county is naturally occurring affordable housing. It isn't subsidized by HUD, it isn't LIHTC, it's just the naturally occurring affordable housing. And most of those units are aging and have over the housing crisis been bought up by LLCs, by REITs, and absentee landlords. And we heard that, and I'm gonna share with you in a couple minutes the slides from the county. We heard that loud and clear from a lot of county jurisdictions, the problem with absentee landlords. And then evictions, you all have taken a, a first step with evictions at the county, and I applaud that. Um, Ohio leads the country, they're number 10 in the country in evictions, and Hamilton County leads, has led the state in the last two years in evictions. So something clearly has to be done because evictions, you know, like having bad credit, if you have an eviction on your, on your credit report, you cannot find housing. Or the housing is doubly more expensive um, because the landlord can do that. <clears throat> so th the reason we did this is because Frankly, the reason I sort of pushed for this is I wanted to raise um, private philanthropic dollars. There's a lot of money out there that's going to a lot of good causes. This, this can't be, like this should be at the top. The health systems all wanna know how to plug in. We're working with Mercy, with TriHealth, with Bethesda Inc. They wanna know how to solve the problem and without a blueprint, like we really don't have anything. So that was my motivation for giving my time and not getting paid to do this because it's really our mission anyway. It's also, there's a lot of policy groups and we have, we're on the vacant property task force. It's a city county task force. We've been meeting for about two years. There's probably four other policy groups out there. Why not pull all the policies together and really take a look at them? Housing court is probably at the top of that list. Housing Trust Fund is also up there, but there are also a lot of policies around evictions and, um, and being able to keep people in their homes longer, but that's, that's just, so we wanted a suite of tools that you all could use, that jurisdictions can use. We wanted funding ideas, and we wanted to know how to direct those dollars. Um, so this whole plan is sort of grounded in production. Um, Preservation, as I mentioned, it's not just preserving the sort of the HUD subsidized units, but that's a problem because we're going to lose, we could lose 10,000 of those over the next 10 years, and most of which are in the city, but some are in the county. Their subsidies are wearing off. Uh, but it's also preservation of the housing stock itself. And then protection. There's a lot in this plan about tenant protections because. You know, it takes 30 days to be evicted. It's, it's, you know, you're one payment away from being able to make your rent. Like, you know, you're, if you miss a paycheck, you, you can't pay your rent. And we have a huge problem with eviction. So we have some recommendations in here, which I'll show you later, around tenant protection. So the plan covers these three topics. And then when we started this um, in January of 2019, we said we had to have guiding principles. and. The, the one of the reasons we picked the Philadelphia plan is because it was grounded in equity and we have a huge equity problem in this 
County, and we decided that we really needed to focus on that issue in, in all aspects of this. So just process we've had, we've worked all, starting in 2018, and we worked all last year, we had a lot of folks um, participating both in the housing, um, in the housing world, uh, people that just wanted to join that had an interest. Uh, I've done at least 40 of the 48 sessions. We've been out in the county, um, three different public sessions, but then Joy helped me divide the, the list, the county jurisdictions into A, B, and C, and sort of I tackled the, probably the easiest ones to talk to so I could get on their calendars. Um, so I ended up uh, speaking to at least 12 and then was involved in ULI TAPS uh, in the county uh, that, that with you, well, I, I'm a member and, and Joy uh, was always at those meetings and so we learned a lot from those. Um, so these are the issues, just, just a summary of some of the issues that we learned from the 12 jurisdictions and the ULI TAPS that we were involved in. Um, people don't like tenants. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's an issue. Um, people in neighborhoods, they want their, their neighborhood to be home home ownership, and the, a lot of these first ring suburbs are turning from home ownership to rental. Um, and then there's a huge absentee landlord problem. This also creates code enforcement. There's a lack of code enforcement in the county. Um, you know, you don't have a centralized code enforcement. You can't with, you know, 48 jurisdictions. But I, we heard it over and over and over again. How do we go after those really bad actors? In the city, I, I don't know whether we've passed this yet, but but uh, rental registration is, a, is something that I know our policy team has worked on for at least three years to try to get passed, and we were fought by the Apartment Association. But finally, we got through the hurdles, and I think uh, that we're going to do a pilot in the city in Price Hill. Um, Cuff, which is the area where all the students live up in Clifton, and Avondale. Large. Uh, rental areas and it's a way in which the city code enforcement can go after the bad actors in those neighborhoods so if they've if they've been cited for lead if they've been cited for code violations have been cited they then the, the building inspector can go in and look um, it's just it's just an example of one of the policies we're going to put out there as a tool that that the jurisdictions could could take a look at uh, many planning grants for business districts you're already doing this we heard loud and clear. We heard that it's working, um, and s they need help with site assemblage, doing mixed-use projects, changing their zoning, that there isn't enough capacity. Uh, we talked a lot about having one group like HCDC or the Port Authority really be out there and helping, helping these groups put together mixed-use projects. Available land, consolidating land, these are all issues that have, that have risen up. And there's a whole list of them that I've, I've um, handed to you. Uh, more ULI taps, we heard, because they, for the most part, they have been really helpful. I know I participated in, in Golf Manors, and I learned so much about this little community. Um, and, and I think the recommendations that came back will be really helpful to them. And, and it's relatively inexpensive uh, compared to a lot of things they could do with consultants. Um, and then we also heard, we heard this all over, both in the city neighborhoods and in the county, that just to have a one-stop resource. Where, where do people go uh, if they have residents that are going to be evicted? Where do people go for, um, for just a variety of issues? So we're going to try to address that in Tom Carroll's Connecting the Dots uh, Suburban Summit in, in April. We're going to try, because this, this has bubbled up so much, we, we need to have a resource, kind of a central resource for a county. Um, some of the barriers, of, this is where I mentioned, there's a renter stigma, which, you know, is part-time building inspectors, education is needed, and we definitely have a NIMBY issue both in the county and the city. Just education around what affordable housing is, what density can do. I mean, I would love to just be able to educate these jurisdictions on how to use mixed-use housing as economic development. How to use housing as economic development. I mean, it's just, it's a driver. I mean, we're seeing this in, we're seeing this clearly in Silverton with their project. Um, and then just lack of funding, lack of knowledge, no one to go to for help, lack of developable land. Um, and then, 
in some of the jurisdictions, they were worried that they, they didn't have the comps to be able to attract developers. Um, and you know, I've been, we have, we have a committee uh, out of this housing strategy that has a lot of developers that sit on it. And after going out and talking to the county, I said, there is so much need in the county. Don't waste your time trying to like go through all the hoops that sometimes you have to go through in city neighborhoods. Go out and help these folks in the county because they have land, they have need, they want to build up their population, especially in Gulf Manor. They need, desperately need population because that's so tax based. Um, and they have land, they just don't know how to put it together. They have remediation issues, so this is where the port can help. So developers are learning along the way as well. We probably had eight to 10 developers involved in this. Um, and then just these are some ideas that both bubbled up out of the research that Tom Carroll did in the first suburbs, but also some of the things that were we're hearing about, and you're also doing, the, the one I put up here first is have neighborhood housing strategies. We started doing this in the city neighborhoods uh, like three, four years ago. Avondale just completed one. The West End, of course, worked on one with the, with, the, with the Port Authority because of FC coming in. These individuals' jurisdictions need to have like their own housing plan, and uh, just because they're so unique. And I know you've already set aside some funding for it. We've heard that so this is really needed, and I think it will help put them on a, a good trajectory to, to do all sorts of programs. Rental registration, as I mentioned, partnering with legal aid, um, it's been a, a godsend to some of our you know, bad landlord issues in the city. Um, property maintenance code, this, I know you can't do this countywide, but it's, it, it will be a tool that individual jurisdictions can if they want to adopt. Um, and this was a recommendation that I didn't totally understand, but the use of CRA for commercial and residential is similar to what Blue Ash did. This bubbled up in the conversation a lot about, we, we want to do what Blue Ash did. Um, and then how to capitalize on affordable housing, as I mentioned, how to, how to use housing as, as an economic development tool. Um, and then education around, just, just educating people about uh, the need for housing affordability all over the city. And there was some talk about everybody taking their sort of fair share and in building projects, doing you know sort of what, what it's called around the country, inclusionary zoning. So if you have 100 units, make 10% of them affordable. Um, developers don't like that particularly, but it's, it's gonna be a recommendation. So these are just big, broad themes. As I mentioned, renters, protection, local capacity. Um, and I'm almost done. Uh, there's an eviction uh, task force that Greg Landsman led, uh, and then there's a property tax review committee that Vice Mayor Smitherman led. Um, there are a lot of, I didn't realize this did this. Um, there's some, these are just, and I've left these with you, just um, samples of the 117 strategies that have bubbled up out of these eight working groups. And we have about 30 policies, which I have a team of policy people sort of going through, consolidating, um, working on sort of the prioritization that'll probably narrow it down to five, six policies. Um, and we will have, clearly have um, that document probably done to be able to present back to you by the end of February, because we're presenting the draft of it um, to the neighborhood summit in March and then to the suburban uh, Connect the Dots summit in April. And we want as much feedback as possible. This is not our plan, this is a community-wide plan. I also wanted to mention, um, I'm gonna jump ahead. So we, when we raised money for the housing strategy, we also hired Cohere. I'm not sure if you know them, but they're um, a community engagement strategy group. They reached out and had um, like eight community conversations with over 100 people. Unfortunately, only eight of them came from the county, but the I, I gave a copy of the report because I thought it was pretty interesting and it's just something to look through. Uh, but this was our qualitative research. So we have all the data from the researchers, but we wanted, we wanted to hear from the everyday experts, the people that faced eviction, the people that have a voucher that can't find a three bedroom house, that have, that have been discriminated against because they have a voucher. I mean, all of this was researched uh, in our qualitative. And they are also part of our working group. So our everyday experts help to inform 
uh, all eight of our working groups. <clears throat> and then these were some of the ideas that came out of the everyday experts. Uh, provide emergency rent and utility assistance. <clears throat> I just met with Job and Family Service. Their PRC, I'm not sure, PRC is 3.5 million a year. And a lot of these county jurisdictions can tap into that as a community partner. And I'm not sure they know that. Um, some of that money is sent back to the feds every year because they can't spend enough of it. They can't spend it. So that is that shouldn't happen. And we plan to um, showcase that at the, neighbor, at the suburban summit um, to let them know that that is a resource for their residents. And I'll let you read that. Um, so this is sort of, the, I found this really interesting. This is uh, research, this is the recommendations that came out of Tom Carroll's research. And I'm not gonna go through it, it's for you to read, but these are recommendations that came from peers within the county about how jurisdiction, different jurisdictions can help in revitalization of theirs. And I told you about next steps. Uh, these are our funders, I have to put that out there. Uh, at and then on the last page, uh, I have my website, and we have tons of data, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you for the thorough report, uh, interim as it is. Um, I have just have a couple of questions just to start off. Um, so help me get an understanding of the document in front of us. So this is a community-wide housing strategy this isn't broken out, uh, and I don't mean city versus county so much as um, any kind of di differentiators between city county. I think part of the complication <coughs> for us is that we're talking about strategies and there are two different kind of pots of money or pots of resources or legislative bodies uh, between the city and the county. And so, um, I, and, I, and I, the city and the county are very different, we've got so much diversity in this county uh, related to some of these other, the 48 jurisdictions outside the city, which is complicating as well. That said, um, are there numbers that are um, city specific and then outside of the city specific? Yes, all the, all the data broke down city and county and side by side. Okay. Um, it, that's why we have over like 90 slides of data. Okay. Uh, there was a lot. I couldn't possibly even like talk through it because I'm not a data person, but it, we were really challenged when we started out. I mean, there were people at City Hall that only wanted it to be city. Mm -hmm. And we, you can't look at data, you can't talk about housing, no matter what kind of housing it is, you can't talk about housing in a vacuum in the city. You have to look at housing because we are ha we, we're finding that people are moving from the city to the county to find more affordable rentals because they are more affordable. And so, so we, we just can't talk about it in a vacuum. So that's why we didn't call it a county plan, a city plan, we called it a community-wide, because we didn't want to really put a label on it. But all the data is both county and city. Okay. Um, and of course we want to work with the city on this. I think, um, I do think the diversity in the county adds a layer of challenge. I think from, from our perspective, um, or at least from my, my understanding of it. So the, the other thing um, is that we need to have structures available to us to start the work, continue the work in some cases. And so I would be interested to know if the um, strategy it probably is not that specific. I mean, it would be up to, because this commission has already said, we want to do more in this space of housing. We've already said that. We've said that related particularly to uh, poverty and the lack of affordable housing in the county as a whole, this commission wants to do more there. We want to be more relevant and be a better partner in that space. I think our next challenge will be how? Uh, what, what structures do we already have in place? Planning and development. I keep looking at Joy. Um, and then what more do we need to do to set up a structure? Uh, the city, I feel like, is, is ahead of us on this, wherein um, you know, they do have, like you said, these plans. You, know, you need a housing strategy in order to implement something or understand the needs. And so we're going to have to sort through how we get to all of that once the final product is in front of us, because you've clearly pointed out 
a need that I think all of us recognize. It's just getting our arms around it. I mean, I feel, I feel like it's daunting, um, but it's time to, you know, dig in, you know, and, and start to figure out how we put things in place to help. I think it could be used as a toolkit for, for the county. As you know, here are, here's what bubbled up, here's what we heard, uh, here's some priorities, uh, and here are ways to do it, and here's what like other cities have done. So we're, mm -hmm. we're using some case studies in the, in the strategy. Counties too? Uh, well, just around the country. I'm, I'm, you know, it's interesting. There haven't, there, there, there haven't been a lot, like mm -hmm. Philadelphia is the city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Charlotte just did um, a housing study, and which out of it came a $250 million fund that was funded by philanthropic money and corporate money. And they put it alongside like city or county money um, to help like increase the number of affordable housing units. So I mean, it's just one little example mm -hmm. why we need a blueprint yeah. and why we have to state the need so strongly. And I, I think doing it in the city alone would just not going to no, get I agree. us there. It kind of misses the mark. Yeah. Um, comments or questions? Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah. Um, great presentation, a lot of information. I'll digest it, and if I need to get back with you, I will. Um, you had mentioned on under issues, and we don't have to go through each one for sure, but code enforcement help is needed. Um, so have you noticed that code enforcement is more extensive in home rule of vicinities, like, I don't know, Forest Park, or Cincinnati has some very stringent code enforcement rules. So have you looked at the rules in different areas and whether or not, because later on you talk about maybe a more consistent code enforcement uh, plan for so the what, area. What we found is that, um, so, so the folks that do code enforcement mm -hmm. are wearing three different hats or it's a part-time, it's somebody retired that they've mm -hmm. hired. And, and it really is code enforcement against the absentee landlords, the, you know, the properties that are overgrown and vacant, it's mm -hmm. like they don't have the ability to go after those. It isn't just blanket code enforcement, mm -hmm. certainly not in the county. Right. They, they, they have the inability to go after one big parcel, mm -hmm. let alone everything. So no, it isn't blanket. It's mainly, it's mainly the bad, the absentee landlords that okay. they have okay. an issue with. I know in Lincoln Heights, our code enforcement person was part-time police officer, and then he was code enforcement in, in the afternoon. You also mentioned in ex existing barriers, one are part-time building inspectors. What demographic are you talking about? It's it's what we've heard from some of the jurisdictions, and I listed listed the ones I can't remember specifically. Um, I think Off Manor might have been one of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's just. There's just not enough money, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these jurisdictions are run by one person, and they can't they can't do all of those jobs. Okay. So that's really what that reference is. Okay. About. And one last question. I don't know where it is now, but you had mentioned in here um, the lack of developmental uh, land. So I'm trying to figure that so, out because you know we heard like in. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was Addiston or Lachlan. We heard we have land, but it's uh -huh. zoned single family. And we can't get a developer to come in and do single okay. family because we don't have the comps. Or we have land, but it's contaminated. And we have to get it remediated first. Or we have land, but we have no way of doing an assemblage. We don't have that development expertise. That's, so that's okay. what you know. I said, well, call the Port Authority. Or you okay. know, maybe it's something that HCDC should carve out as a, as a niche for the mm -hmm. county. So, so do you have in a study or in some of your statistics like uh, an area that has land, but for this reason or this variable, it can't be developed? Have you divided I, no, that we up? we haven't or? gone that deep. Okay, all right. I do have a lo list of all the vacant properties in Hamilton County that okay. we surveyed. That, okay. that resides sure. on a map with the Port Authority. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your report. I'm looking forward to um, the rest of it. I'd, I'd like to see what 90 pages. And um, like President Driehaus says, uh, this board is, uh, we're dedicated to addressing housing and disparities in, in, in housing, um, housing gaps, poverty, that kind of thing. And I'd like to take a look at this further and, and come back with questions.
Thank you. It, it is a little overwhelming, <laughs> uh, for sure. And, and the other thing, and I'm going to ask Jeff this. So once we get a final report, and you, in your remarks, and, and per the questions, have said, well, maybe it's HCDC, maybe it's the Port Authority, maybe it's Planning and Development. And I think that's kind of where we sit. It's like, all right, well, once we identify some of the needs and opportunities, then we have to figure out what structure do we have here at the county to plug in because it's it's all of those um so jeff um i'm wondering your thoughts on that and also um once the final comes forward if we could have the administration um, help us better figure out a framework where when you talk about site readiness that's the port when you talk mm -hmm. about uh you know blighted pro that's the port when you talk about community development plans no no that's planning and development so i mean it's we're all over the map on this stuff i think partly because we have not we've been engaged in this space but i don't know that we've tried to put a framework around some of it so can you help us think I, through that as we get the final yeah and I think you just hit the nail on the head like with so many issues at the, at the county level I mean, counties are as folks for folks watching at home you know counties do a lot of statutory work the counties are required or mandated to do certain things by the Ohio Revised Code and policy direction of the board allows us to use those different mandates and those different departments that exist through mandate for different policy related functions so for instance in the area of housing like you mentioned there's a lot of stuff going on even a lot of stuff that uh, is identified in this report you know we do uh, we offer planning grants uh, business quarter planning grants that were that were that were listed here uh, we have affordable housing grants uh, through through community development we have a prevention retention and contingency program as Kathy indicated uh, through job and family services we have our site readiness funding that we're offering uh, to, to the Port Authority we have CRAs that HCDC implements but we don't have a big umbrella structure around it and I think that's critically important to do because without putting that structure around it, without wrapping that up, you can't really see where the gaps are and where you may need to put that next dollar in order to be most effective. So yeah, on behalf of the administration, I'd be happy to, uh, to work on something that would coincide with a follow-up report on this that would put that umbrella around, here's all the stuff we're doing in this space so that the board can decide where do we want to go next? Is it property maintenance? Is it more needed on poverty reduction? Is it more on rapid rehousing on the homeless side? I think where do we want to go with this? So mm -hmm. I'd be happy to pull that together as a staff report over the next couple of weeks okay. uh, and maybe coincide that with the uh, with the follow up presentation well, from Kathy when she's ready. And also it occurs to me as you were talking through some of the code enforcement and, and those those things that um, the jurisdictions, you know, the city is very different in that way. You know, they've got folks doing this and, you know, it proactively in some cases, but in the county, gosh, they just don't have the capacity uh, to do this in some of these smaller jurisdictions. So is there a shared services piece to this where the county steps in and says, as we have in other spaces, we will provide this function. You all can partner with us, pay in. We will partner with you and try to do this a little more effectively and relieve them of the burden because we've got some expertise and we can partner in that way. So this occurs to me, it could be a shared services summit uh, topic uh, for our next time out. And I know Tom Carroll's doing a lot of work in this space too. But so there's this shared services piece that it occurs to me we need to pursue as well to create some efficiencies. Uh, so, so, okay, so all of the above, uh, but thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Kathy, for um, helping us figure this out because it's, it, it's complicated, uh, but the county, um, it, it's such, we, we have such an important role to play here as these needs spread into the jurisdictions outside the mm -hmm. city. So we really appreciate it. So when are you coming back with the final, did you say? Uh, bef probably before the end of <coughs> February. Okay, so we'll see you soon. Okay. All right. on the calendar. Okay, and, all right, thank you, Madam, yeah. Uh, Madam President, yes. I just wanted to comment on what you were saying about shared services. Certainly will save us some money, but at the same time, we need to have a standard of code enforcement in different areas because um, you know, we may think it's okay, and I keep bringing up Fort Spark, uh, but you look at Cincinnati and what their standards are, and as I said earlier, much higher than what maybe Forest Park or Green Hills may be. So to provide some consistency as it relates to what code enforcement is in each area. I think if you look mm -hmm. at the, the rental registration legislation that targets mm -hmm. the really bad Mm -hmm. um, like the, there's a list of if you've done this, 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 or this, mm -hmm. then you get the code, you get the violations. <coughs> I mean, mm -hmm. so I think uh, I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
No, I'm just thinking. I, I saw you reaching <laughs> for the mic. <laughs> All right, thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you again. All right. Um, we will move on to our second item, uh, Over the Rhine Special Improvement District. I know Greg Olson is here. Um, Jeff, do you want to give us the lay of the land, just, or is Greg going to do that for just us? Just very, very quickly, um, Greg is here to talk about uh, the concept that's been talked about for, gosh, I know the concept of, of a special improvement district in Over the Rhine has been uh, talked about uh, oh, for at least the past decade, Greg. I don't know, maybe uh, yes, may maybe years. longer. But uh, and not to steal any of Greg's thunder, but uh, for those watching at home, a uh, special improvement district is essentially just a way of funding a, an, uh, an enhanced level of service in a specific geographic region over and above what's traditionally provided by the, the local government. So right. we, uh, we currently have a special improvement district that's in place uh, for the uh, downtown central business district. Um, that the county pays into as a um, uh, as an assessed value against its front footage of, of property that's owned. Uh, so Greg's going to going to walk us through uh, the concept of a special improvement district uh, in the over the Rhine area. Uh, this is important to the county as both a uh, a, a uh, central property owner in the downtown area, but also someone that has property um, in uh, the over the Rhine area as well. So uh, Greg, with that, I'll. Leave thank you, to take thank it away. you, Jeff. I appreciate that. And commissioners, I know this is probably a bittersweet um, moment too for you, especially you, Ms. Parks. So, thank you, Commissioner Parks and Driehaus and Dumas. So, I'm Greg Olson. I'm CEO of Urban Sites, and I am on the Over the Rhine Special Improvement District uh, Committee. I am one of the co-chairs, along with Bobby Maley and and Stephanie Gaither, Stephanie Gaither of Al Nyer and Bobby Maley of uh, the Model Group. As you can see, that there's a listing of our current committee and, and the diversity of that committee uh, as, it, as a makeup of residents of Over the Rhine, um, businesses, and uh, OTR Chamber, Corporation for Finley Market, and uh, some not-for-profits, including Over the Rhine Community Housing, where Andy Hutzel and uh, William Thomas from Mortar, many of you are probably very familiar with the great work that the gentlemen at Mortar are doing. Um, our purpose and our core values. It, you know, it's really as a committee is to have a safer and cleaner over the Rhine. And, and I want to preface this a little bit um, with what we already what we're currently doing right now. There is a group of stakeholders and other um, business owners that are contributing to about a three hundred thousand dollar budget to have specialized services in a very um, in a much smaller district than what we're proposing to do. With, uh, within this special improvement district. So currently we don't have a special improvement district, but 3CDC along with Model and ourselves over the Rhine uh, Community Housing, over the Rhine uh, Chamber of Commerce, we all contribute from our own pockets to about a $300,000 budget to an area that's probably, I'd say, Ray Street to Maine from 14th down to Central Parkway. And it's a much smaller portion of this district that we're um, pushing for but we are providing a lot of these different services that I'm going to talk about right now, but it's not sustainable. Um, so I'll, in, in purposes, uh, for purposes of transparency, that's why I'm sharing that with you. Um, we are looking for hyper locality in our purpose and our core values. You know, we want to focus on hiring folks from within our, um, within our neighborhood and using their services and the vendors from that uh, location to help us perform these services. Uh, diversity is a very important piece of our, of our core value and our purpose, where we're pushing for a variety of interests and perspectives on our board. And you'll see later the board makeup. We have 12 board members, of which 11 are voting. And that's towards the end of this presentation, where you'll see the makeup and the geographic expansion. So currently, we're looking at, you know, over the Rhine extends from Central Parkway to Reading, Reading to uh, Liberty, and then it makes its way up to McMicken and then back down Central Parkway. So our smaller district, uh, the, the initial geographic area, will basically run Central Parkway to, um, I think, Spring Street and Spring Street up to 13th. Spring Street is where Pendleton is, Pendleton Art Center. Um, and then make a left on 13th Street, come to Broadway and go north, and that'll run right into Liberty. And then we'll come all the way across Liberty to Central Parkway again, and then back down Central Parkway and make the, the big turn. So that's the, um, that's the geographic area we're talking about. 
the background, uh, we started, to Jeff's point, we started about eight years ago looking at a special improvement district for over the Rhine, but the property values weren't there. Um, still, as, as you know, over the Rhine has grown in, in popularity and value over the last 10 years quite substantially. But prior to that, there wasn't enough property value to really justify the amount of money that was going to need to be spent to make the improvements. So um, DCID, which has been in place, their, their special improvement district has been in place for 20 years and has been quite successful and now um, administered by 3CDC. Um, and the way right now we have th three CDC over the Rhine Chamber and a variety of those stakeholders that I showed you before have, as I shared, we continue to voluntarily and we've done urban sites has contributed, oops, here's my paperwork, um, for the last five years um, with, our, with our own funds to pay for a much smaller district. Um, so what is a SID? Is this making sense so far, everyone? Okay. Can I can I just ask a, a question of clarity? So to be clear, yes. there is an SID for um, the business district. What this contemplates is an SID for the over the Rhine area. That's correct. There okay. is a special improvement district that Check. takes up the central business district. Got it. And the reason why we're here today is because part of their district actually crosses Central Parkway, which includes the Job and Family Services building the park house garage and I believe it's just those two locations currently um, so they are they in order to get their initial vote and I'll explain how we get to that in a few moments um, in order for them to make that happen uh, I think that they uh, petitioned the, the commissioners 20 years ago to participate in this and they did because government agencies and um, churches are not required to participate they can opt in and when they do opt in, then they participate just like everyone else does based on your linear feet that you um, are along any street or, or alley and on the value, uh, some percentage of your value too. And that's, that's determined by the trustees of these not-for-profit corporations called the SID. So a special improvement district is a structured method for raising funds in a geographical area in order to manage and deliver critical services above the level of services that you would normally receive in that area. So, and it's a system which multiple unrelated property owners um, cooperate and share costs among themselves. It creates a sustainable system. So we'll vote for a certain number of years that the SID will last and then it will be up for vote again. And then it's, so it's multiple years and it creates a, and then they're responsible for creating the services plan as well as the budgets. And it's authorized by the government through legislation that defines that organization's purpose and their governing structure. So once this SID is approved, should it be approved, it would be paid through the county, through your, you pay it through your semi-annual property taxes. So you're literally electing to have yourself taxed at another level. How about if I move on to the... No, this, we're, we're way behind here, Greg. Right? Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I have to keep putting my glasses on and off, so I apologize. We're, we're up to date, I think, here at the uh -huh. day. I sure all right, you all, have, <laughs> you all have a copy of it, though, in front of you, so sorry to the public. I apologize for that. Um, so funded by the property owners, and then the boundary is also determined by the property owners, and then the service plan is also determined by that. Now, how does it become a, how does a SID come into, uh, come into, come into play? So we have, uh, the, the process is 60% of the linear feet of all of over the Rhine, at least the area that we've selected so far, um, has to literally sign the dotted line and say, yes, I want to opt into this plan. If we don't achieve 60%, it's done, we don't move forward. If we do, everyone, whether you chose to vote for it or not, will be um, part of this special improvement district and you will be required to participate financially. But you can also participate on the board and you know, so there's an election process. Um, and the downtown SID is a 501c3. So here's where we are currently. We have this committee who's been working together since 2017 to start uh, the process of trying to create a SID. This past fall, I would say starting in August, we had gone through the public feedback process where we met a number of times at Memorial Hall and other public spaces like 3CDC 
to have the public come in and listen to what we uh, were planning and hoping to do. I know I personally had over 40 meetings with individual property owners in Over the Rhine just to explain what we've been doing. And I know quite a few of my uh, committee members have done the same. I don't know if they had 40 meetings, but I know that I had them because it was a very busy October and November. Um, so where we are right now is we think we're prepared to go to a vote. And I think the voting paperwork will come out February 17th or 18th. And they'll be mailed to all the property owners. And they have the option to sign. And if they do, submit it to us. And if we achieve 60% of the linear feet, and for what it's worth, there's 77,000 linear feet of uh, roadways in over the Rhine, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then we'll, we'll go through the process. Of, if that happens and we get 60%, city council would approve to vote to approve the SID, and property owners um, would vote on the, who the SID board members might be. So how is it governed? It's independent nonprofit corporation. Property owners elect a board of trustees responsible for developing the service plan and all the services, usually by hiring a third party provider. And that currently third party provider is 3CDC and we would be looking to them to maximize um, some cost savings and efficiencies. And we would, we were hoping that they would have the best proposal, but we will be sending it out to more than one. Uh, and then we'll be determining the, the assessment criteria on how the expenses will be shared. But right now it's 25% linear feet, 75% um, property value. And that's what we've been sharing with all the potential um, affected landowners and property owners in Over the Rhine. And so the next important thing is almost 100% of the net assessments go to the trustees for the service plan. One of the beautiful things for the county is that three to 4% of the money stays with the county to administer some of the expenses. So. We're looking at of a budget of 775,000 of which 125,000 of that 775 will be paid for by current stakeholders over and above their assessment, which includes 3CDC and probably urban sites and model group and a, a number of others. So the net budget is 650,000, 650,000 times three or 4% ranges anywhere from 19,500 to $26,000 a year. That would remain with the county to help with the administration and uh, the taxing and the tracking of that taxing for the special improvement district of over the Rhine. So how do other cities do it? In, in our own city, DCID is downstairs is, is, and we're in the central business district and it's been in place for 20 years. There are a thousand other US cities that currently have these. And uh, New York City alone has 74 and 39 are in low to moderate income income neighborhoods. And from what I understand, only a few have ever uh, voted to terminate their own existence. So here's how the DCID is voted from 1998 to 2001. They were, as you can see, three or four percent over the 60 percent threshold uh, in terms of linear feet. And that small dotted line, which I can't see unless I put my glasses back on, um, shows you that over the years they have pretty much been at 70 percent or higher in terms of wanting to maintain their DCID in um, downtown central business district. Why is it needed in Over the Rhine? Well, the, like I said earlier, the funding of the current ser services are privately controlled and they're just not sustainable. Um, and the SID is the best mechanism to replace that funding. Um, it's, we're also looking at it for long-term sustainability for services ensures critical services remain in place and are optimized to meet the needs of the residents and the businesses and all the visitors who are coming to Cincinnati. And we hope for geographic expansion. As you know, I was saying it's just a much smaller little district that we're personally and privately paying for. We want to expand that to the rest of um, this expansive area. And I think I have a slide that will show you what that looks like. This next picture just shows you some of the different water we have potted plants and we have ambassadors and they help pressure wash the sidewalks and pick up um, pick up trash um, other amenities or other services that are performed include um, painting over poles that get graffitied walls that get graffitied sidewalks that are graffitied um, planters changed out three to four times a year depending on the season the types of plant material you have it in, it's basically in, intended to make this destination very um, uh, guest friendly, but also 
very friendly for the businesses and the residents that live in that area. Um, the next slide shows you the area that's to be included. So you can see the area that's shaded in red is our phase one. We really wanted to go north and, and east, um, but currently north of Central Parkway, the values just don't support it yet. There would be significantly more work than, and cost than the values could support. But our goal as part of our, uh, you know, our future mission and values is to grow eastward into, throughout the rest of Pendleton, as well as throughout the, uh, the rest of over the Rhine as that continues to, to be developed. The level of service, I can go over a little bit, the visibility and safety presence. So 3CDC already has ambassadors that they have on the street as a part of the smaller um, focused stakeholder group where they are walking the streets or checking with um, different businesses, um, picking up trash, communicating with visitors, communicating with people who are looking for directions graffiti removal we pick up weeds there's snow shoveling on the sidewalks snow removal um, social service coordination so they're helping with folks identify where they can go to get social outreach services so they provide those individuals who are you know marginalized who have uh, who have found themselves on the street and they're helping them find the right services they coordinate with keep Cincinnati beautiful and urban forestry and the park board for additional beautification um, projects. Now the level of service depending on the budget uh, can be enhanced or reduced depending on what the board you know that the board of trustees that are elected decide and you know that could include community engagement social media um, or we could just cut back on services because we feel like we're spending we're not getting the value for our investment. Change. Cost to the property owners so like we said, it's a $775,000 budget where 125 will be contributed by 3CDC and other community partners, leaving 650000 to be paid for by the special improvement property owners, which also includes 3CDC and urban sites and model groups. So we will be, I know I'll be paying um, as part of the $650,000 budget in addition to uh, the 125000 uh, the basis of assessment we decided would be based on a weighted average of 25% of front footage and 75% of, um, it's up here now, sorry about that, and 75% of the county auditor assessed value. Um, and then you can see how, the, how it's calculated up there. So we assume the assessment's approximately $2.03 per linear foot plus $1.20 per thousand dollars of market value, assessed value, market, assessed market value. And so the cost to the property owners continues. Um, for example, a condo assessed by the auditor at 175,000 with a proportionate five linear front footage would pay $214 annually. And a commercial building assessed at 800,000 with 200 linear foot frontage would pay $1,366 annually. The current estimated assessed value according to the auditor site of every one of these properties is about $188 million currently. Jeff, some folks from your, your organization has helped us assemble all this data, so it's been very helpful and very much appreciated. Uh, this is a, um, an idea of what the board structure would look like. Uh, we would have two appointed by the, uh, the mayor and city council, one appointed by the administrator and commission president appointee from the county, which obviously we're looking to you, um, residential single family or condo owner, a retail representative, a nonprofit property owner, a large property owner with greater than 500 linear feet of frontage, medium, small, and you can see how it's broken out. Then we'd have an at-large property owner, uh, two at-large property owners, and a residential renter, which would be just a representative because they're a renter, they don't have an ownership stake, but they would be non-voting, but we definitely want their perspective on the board. The next steps is all the public feedback has been received. Committee pro proposed a service plan, which the final plan is ready. And like I said, those go to a vote in February. Uh, the final meetings were held in November and additional outreach communication. So we are intending to um, have a small public awareness campaign that we will put on just 
to continue to share what's happening in the community and what we intend to do. And then on the 18th, the letters and ballots for votes go out. And then if there was any other information, and all this information is available on OTR Chambers website. So it's otrchamber.com forward slash safety and beautification. And then we have our frequently asked questions, slide deck, which is what I pre presented today, and the Board of Governance, as well as the draft of the service plan, which I think I also provided to you all. Um, so what is, what is our ask? Our ask um, for the commission is that you would opt in to this plan. And that plan looks like about Let's see, I think we're at $16,000 would be your, that you'd be paying a duplicate of for the first couple of years because you are also part of the downtown district and an additional $5,000 for Memorial Hall, which is also owned by the county. So about $20,000 would be our ask over the next couple of years while um, we try to make our, our intent is to vote for our um, special improvement district to co-terminate with DCIDs. So when theirs is up for renewal and ours is up for renewal, we would hope to then make the boundary so that Over the Rhine truly has all the Over the Rhine properties and Central Business District has truly all the Central Business District properties. And then you wouldn't be double paying for additional years at that point in time. So that's... Okay. My present, yeah, any questions? Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is a question for you or for Jeff. Um, so what percentage of the geography that's been identified is owned by the county? Do you know that? I don't know. The, 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 the main buildings we've identified right now are the Park House Garage. It's uh, the 22 Central, which is Job and Family Depke Services, yeah. and, and Memorial Hall. Reading. Those are your two properties. And I don't know the linear feet, okay. but you're... The price for the uh, job and family alms and Depke is, we think, is eighty three hundred and fifty six dollars, and the Park House Garage is twenty seventy six hundred and forty nine dollars, and it actually that's sixteen thousand and five bucks is, is what we're looking for, um, for those plus, two buildings. plus Memorial Hall plus Memorial Hall, which is about five thousand dollars. Right. So, those are those are the three primary properties we have. We may have some other scraps here and there, uh, but those would okay. be the primary with right. front with front footage. Okay. I also want to know if there's a discount for government There's not. <laughs> uh, other than the ability to opt out, um, well, which, which exists, right. right. Okay. Right, that's right. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from the commissioners? I have no questions. Okay. Commissioner Parks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I do have a question. So. what is done on a regular basis to these properties in Memorial Hall? Like, like, so what would you guys do? Is there a lot of graffiti to be removed? Yes, I don't have the exact statistics on how much trash has been removed every day in the small area that is currently managed. Mm -hmm. um, but there are ambassadors that are on the street every day. Communic you probably see them in their red shirts and they're constantly communicating with visitors, guests, <coughs> uh, residents, anybody who's looking for directions. They are checking in at different uh, restaurants and, and, and uh, businesses along every one of those streets, um, providing help, just making, you know, it's important that we ask them to touch and record that they're there so we know that that's actually happening so that they're making their rounds, that they're making their way up Vine Street and up they're making their way up Main Street. The, um, the planted, the potted plants are, are done three or four times a year. They're watered. Uh, there's coordination with uh, Cincinnati Parks to water, and they're paid to do that through this fund that we have of $300,000. Um, I can tell you that the plowing of the snow, we haven't had much snow lately, but, you know, in the past few years, we've had where we've had snow at the streets, uh, excuse me, the sidewalks and the entryways get uh, shoveled and, and plowed. Um, they are removing graffiti. They are removing the plastic uh, garbage um, bins from inside of the, the green uh, steel casings and replacing those. Anytime there's overflow of garbage, they're, 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 
they're removing that on an as-needed basis, cleaning up after events that occur in over the Rhine in those in those vicinities, um, picking up dog waste, picking up trash, and it happens every single day. I see it because I'm I, you know, at 1209 Sycamore is our office, and it's happening every day. And I'm certain that it's happening because I pay a lot of money. And I make sure that if it's not happening, I call and talk to the, the, the gentleman, uh, David Visman at 3CDC, who coordinates this. And I said, hey, can you take a look at Woodward? We have, you know, we have uh, some excess trash there. So this is happening every single day. And uh, it makes an enormous difference on how the community looks and feels. It includes putting down uh, mulch. Uh, a lot of, yeah, it's, it really makes a big difference to see. And it changes the, the way the streets look. The pressure washing occurs in the summer and spring times. It always looks so nice. Yeah. I do have another question. Yeah, go ahead. So included in the level of service, you said that there is social service coordination outreach. Right. Where, where does that come from? Who does that? So 3CDC um, is, has made it a point to make sure they're aware of all the different outreach services that surround us. And if anybody looks like they need or acts in a way or is specifically asking for help, they know where to direct them, whether it's Tender Mercies or the Cat House or if it's um, sending up to our, our daily bread or um, the drop-in center, they know and they're aware of all the local social services and it's part of their mission is to make sure that these folks get directed and helped. Okay, so let me make sure that I understand this, that the agencies that participate in the SID. Well, it's not a SID yet. Well, in this little small group. In the area. Yes. Where, where you want the SID. Yes they are providing the social services well, um, you know well, well, yeah like, like I, I can so. I can see I can yeah, see tender are. mercies yeah. seeing somebody and providing the aid that they mm -hmm. need but I'm just I'm just asking you about this bullet point that says that you guys provide social service coordination outreach yeah, just I think you know just, who, who does that it's the ambassadors that are okay. on the street. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. They just know, you know, who to where to direct folks. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. As it relates to her question, um, the social service aspect, is there any overlap? Like, does the city also come in, or JFS also come in? Just the ones that you've designated in that area to do it. So there's no overlap. Not that I'm aware of. It's and how to, so it's they just, know the boundaries and they don't come past that. I don't know what the county does, JFS does, in terms of that specific area. But if if someone reaches out to an ambassador on the street uh -huh. or the ambassador sees someone in distress, they will, you know. They, they, I understand the ambassadors. I just said, is there an overlap where the city can also come in that boundary, that area? Oh, we, yeah, we're not kicking anybody So there's out coordination there, and collaboration with the city and? Absolutely. Okay. So they are in communication with the city services as well. So okay. they, they know who That's great. their neighborhood liaison is with the police and Good. their relationships with it, directly with the city. So they're in constant communication yeah. so that we're not duplicating mm -hmm. or okay. trying not to duplicate mm -hmm. work. So, because this is an added layer. This is an added I mean, layer. So the services. city services still exist, but this is an added expense to the property owners in the area because they want an added layer of all of the above, the, the cleaning, the, the ambassadors on the street and all the rest of it. So you, we're really, that's what is being asked for here. I that's think that, right, that added that's layer. Right. Jeff, give us some context, would you, um, related to the business district SID and our participation in that? Yeah, so um, we are currently a member of the, of the downtown uh, special improvement district. We have um, multiple properties that, um, are, are in, that are involved in that. We have 800 Broadway, the, the courthouse, uh, this building. Um, we have um, uh, 230 East 9th. Um, I can get the breakdown of, of cost for that. The, the, the overlap that we're potentially looking at is primarily um, uh, just job and family services and the park house garage would be are the two that are currently also in the downtown improvement district that we would be looking over the short to midterm here to extract from assuming the the over the Rhine special improvement district goes into effect to extract that and and have it just as Greg said co-terminate such that 
those are only paying into the over the Rhine special improvement district. But all of our, most of our downtown properties pay into the downtown special improvement district right now. Right. So uh, just to be make put a finer point on that, if I, I want to make sure I, I'm getting this. So Alms and Depke and Park House are included right now, but then would transfer over to a different SID, the OTR SID. Ev uh, at least eventually. It right. probably wouldn't happen right away, but it yeah, would it happen. It can't happen within, right away. Right. We can't take from there. I but see. at some point in time, when they co-terminate, the intent would be to request that they, that the DCID allow those to come into our district. Right, right. And I, I think our budget is much smaller. Uh, I mm -hmm. think this is dramatically bigger. I think it's somewhere between two and three million dollars, whereas ours is six hundred and fifty thousand. Right. So, but so <coughs> Memorial Hall is the ad here. Right. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which is about we think 5, about five thousand dollars. Right. Okay. So that would be the ad. So this, uh, I just now I'm starting to think asking, about the finances here. So okay. this overlap period, um, I assume that if we're already paying into one SID, uh oh. Um, no. So there, there would be an additional cost of around fifteen thousand dollars or so for the for the first couple of years okay. until they co-terminate at such a time when we could remove the two properties and put them into the over the Rhine special improvement because district. it's already been budgeted in the initial yes, SID. we can't take from theirs and we don't intend to okay it wouldn't be able okay. until they both co-terminate okay all right great so so you're doing the survey yes when will the results of the survey be available? we've given ourselves 60 days or so to okay. you know it, it takes a while you know people get mail they don't always look at it you, we want to follow up with them and and encourage them to send in, let us know one way or the other. And that's why we spent so much time in October and November getting initial feedback to see who, if we were even close to 60%. And we are very close to that. And okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, you know, there's so many folks that just own like 1.1% that you, there was like 400 and some names on, or five, 500 or so names on the, the list that was submitted to us from the county. So obviously we can't meet with everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so we hope to then follow up and and get to a point where we achieve 60%. Okay. So we're also going so to hear back from you. <laughs> but for sure. But having the county in it would be an enormous um, um, push towards success for us. Mm -hmm. So that's, okay. why we're, that's what we're here to ask for. Great. All right, great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the presentation. No more further questions. Or no questions. All right, thank you. All right, we do have a speaker's card. Um, it is Derek Lassen Game. Am I Am I right? I hope it close. Very, you. Very good. You've got the pleasure of the floor for two minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Madam uh, President. I appreciate your, uh, the opportunity to address this uh, board uh, this afternoon here. Um, coming in regards to the affordable um, housing uh, presentation that was done earlier. Um, I think that the Port Authority is perhaps one of the greatest threats to affordable housing in Hamilton County. Uh, Bond Hill Community Council uh, had requested um, office space in one of the Port, of Port Authority's um, offices that they're occupying in Bond Hill. They were denied that. They were told to put a business plan together and do all these various um, uh, runs of the hoop to, to, to just get space to be able to facilitate the Bond Hill Community Council meetings and things of that nature. Um, I think that's, that's an insult to the Bond Hill community and I think somebody should address the Port Authority on getting space because they have bought thousands of properties in this county in poor and black communities. And um, if you cannot, if community councils cannot conduct business in those properties that they're occupying, uh, even for a small space to do transactions, transactional businesses, they don't need to be in those neighborhoods. The other thing is it was suggested that people are moving out of uh, the city uh, uh, to the county for affordable housing. They're not moving. Uh, to the county or because of affordable housing. They're moving because Democrats' policies have pushed them in a situation where they can't find housing in the city, and these policies are pushing them out to the suburbs because the, suburb, the suburbs have opened up their doors uh, to them. The other thing is I don't have faith that Democrats at, at the county level is, is capable of providing affordable housing for people in, in, in this county. You all have created detriment, detrimental policies throughout since the 1940s that has hurt and harmed poor and working communities in this county. So I don't, I don't, I don't believe you all can correct the issues that you've created. I also think we need more jobs in this county. We need affordable jobs. Affordable housing is the enemy to home ownership. We need to stop talking about affordable housing and start talking about home ownership so people can get pathways to success. And finally, uh, Ms. Dumas, I object to the hiring of Bobby Hilton as your chief of staff. I think it's a conflict of interest. And I think as a public servant, uh, you need to be investigated by the Ohio Ethics Commission. I've formally filed a complaint against your office this morning. All right. Thank you for your comments. 
Um, with that, we are going to move to the rest of our agenda, which is executive sessions. Um, if there's nothing further, I'm going to move that we go into a executive session pursuant to RC Section 121.22G4 to conduct or review negotiations or bargaining sessions concerning employee compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment and an executive session pursuant to RC Section 121.22G2 to discuss the acquisition of property. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right.